on this edition of Mississippi Roads, we stop at the town of Ruleville, Mississippi. We check in on a man whose name you might not be familiar with, but you've probably seen a lot of his work on screen in the theater. Plus, a man who's overcome a significant obstacle to create amazing art. And finally, a man who's traveling the country to bring his vision of America back to Mississippi. It's coming up next on Mississippi Roads. Support for the arts segment of Mississippi Roads comes from the Mississippi Arts Commission, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the arts and creativity in Mississippi. Information available at www.arts.ms.gov. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Now Mississippi Roads. Today we're visiting Ruleville in Sunflower County. It's a small town in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. And although the town is small, it's big on talent and it's huge in its influence in the civil rights era. Ruleville got its start in the early 1800s, but it really took a foothold in 1878. That's when the government dredged the Sunflower River and allowed boat navigation up to this point. And since then, the small town has continued to exist. It's given rise to more than a few notable names that have helped change the American musical and political landscape. And we'll come back to those people in just a few minutes. But for now, we're gonna take a look at another Ruleville native. Now, you might not recognize his name, but if you've been in the movie theater in the last couple of decades, I'm sure you've seen some of his work. When Horace Greeley said, go west, young man, he may well have been talking to Luster Bayless of Ruleville, who, as a young man, left the Mississippi Delta and went west to Hollywood to seek his fame and fortune. Luster Bayless may have been born into poverty, but he made his name and found his fame here in glittering Los Angeles. He's got, probably got one of the largest costume houses in the world, a sharecropper son from Mississippi. We lived on this plantation and we would have so many acres there that we could farm. When you start getting the cotton in, you're supposed to get some of the seed money. But really, they never gave us any of that, so you, you were in the hole, and you stayed in the hole. And that's what the whole plantation thing was. When we got into high school and started playing football together, sometimes Luster couldn't come to practice because he'd be out in the fields working. But he was still voted captain of the football team, well, after high school and then two years in the Navy, Luster Bayless was back here in Ruval. But then his friend Jimmy, who had gotten a job in the costuming business out in Los Angeles, called Luster one night and said he had lined him up in an interview. And I said, I'm leaving here tomorrow. I'm going west. So he hitchhiked to L.A. I got the interview because of Jimmy, but I did not have the job. I had an interview. Wow, I'm sort of scared there. There wasn't an opening. In fact, there were 75 applicants ahead of him. I said, give me anything you got. I don't care what it is. And I looked him in the eyeball when I said it. And he leaned back in a chair like this and scratched his head a couple of times. And then he rose up in the chair and he said, I'll tell you what, you come to work Monday morning at 10, uh, 9 o'clock. After two or three years of wardrobe backup work, Bayless went to Arizona to assist on the movie McClintock. He worked with John Wayne. That led to another John Wayne Western and an offer. He said, look, I want you to do all my movies. And I says, okay, let's go for it. He said, I got six of them lined up right now. Luster went on to become one of Wayne's dear friends. He knew my history from sharecropper all the way. And he, 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 he respected a person who came from something and made something. I just said, uh, their collaboration lasted for the rest of John Wayne's career. And when his friend was dying, Luster took him a note. My note says, Duke, you got a tough poker hand out to you. But knowing how lucky you draw a poker, you'll come out a winner. Here's an old friend pulling for you on your next draw. He has my friendship with you, Duke. It made me a better person, thanks. In his years of working with John Wayne, Luster collected quite a few costumes. So in 1977, just a couple of years before Duke's death, he opened his own business. Luster would buy wardrobe from studios that were getting out of the movie business, you know, the wardrobe business. 
My whole thing was to build American history from 1770s to 1970s. And in that 200 year span, I want to make sure that we could give them the look from the head to the toe. Also in characterization, or if it's summer or winter, or better dress, I'm going to build this place that way. And that's what I did. And now, American costume, it is huge. His costume house is so perfect, you know. Size, colors, you know, it's just amazing, you know. And when you first go in there, it's just like, wow, this is something else. Well, you see, this is 20s, 30s, and 40s. And we, we, we do this from left to right. Everything is left to right. This starts with small sizes, and you go big sizes. And we know what period it is because it tells you on the front. So you got to have the entire thing here so it gives you what you need as far as that look. And he's costumed everything from Lincoln to NCIS. And when you costume head to toe, you gotta have hats. Old hats made new. No matter how old the hat looks outside, we like for a, a band to be on there for sweat. And new hats made old. A bunch of these hats were aged right out there in that parking lot. I'm throwing dirt on them, I spit on them, I put the sweat around the brims. Ethnic hats, ladies' hats, children's hats. And when his collection got too big, he opened a second shop nearby, this one specializing in uniforms. On the way there, we learned a little more about how Luster Bayless began his costume business. This is where I was. You see where those cars are? There was no fence there. And I was in this little room right in here. And that's how big it's gotten. If I said I had planned all this to be this way, I would be lying. I don't know, just, I just didn't give up. Bayless's persistence is evident in his military shop, starting with the American Revolution through the Civil War and into Vietnam. Officer and enlisted, every branch of service, and of course, every detail from head to toe. And he doesn't stop there. Check out the civilian uniforms, fire, police, even Cub Scouts. This building also contains one personal treasure. This is Seth Banks' work box. He gave me this when he retired. Seth Banks is Jimmy's uncle. He's the one that got us all out here. Beta still calls Mississippi home, and these days he splits his time between Hollywood and Rouville, where his costume museum houses over 1,000 of his favorite pieces. I didn't want it out there in Hollywood. I put it here in the hometown where I came from, and I believe that's where it should be for people to see and enjoy. These are items from Luster's long career, the Shootist, Gunsmoke, Tom Horn, to Appaloosa, and to the recent Django Unchained. And of course, there's a large display dedicated to John Wayne, including this telegram Duke dictated from his deathbed. I like to do things here and donate the contributions if anything comes in. I give it to the John Wayne cancer thing in Santa Monica. There's no money that goes out of here, it goes to the, uh, the cancer. It was great to see my dear friend Luster do, accomplish what he did and what he's still doing. We're standing at a park in Rural, Mississippi, dedicated to a lady by the name of Fannie Lou Hamer. Ms. Hamer was a civil rights pioneer who helped pave the way for the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s. Fannie Lou Hamer was instrumental in helping organize the Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1964. And after that, she joined with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and helped minorities gain political clout in the state. But it's not just Fannie Lou Hamer who paved the way for Americans. Every time you drive on one of Mississippi's many highways, you've got another Rouville lady to thank, Horace Stanzel. And in 1928, the governor of Mississippi appointed him to take a look at the roads in Mississippi and see what needed to be done. And thus was passed the Stanzel Act of 1930, 
which established the system of paved roads in Mississippi. So I guess you could say Horace Stanzel gave Mississippi roads, meaning this show, the Mississippi roads that we drive on. And the people in Ruville really do care a lot about their community. The North Sunflower Medical Center was about to go under in 2007 when Billy Marlowe was appointed interim director. Having no knowledge of the medical field, he had no idea that what he and the hospital did over the next few years couldn't be done. They have completely rebuilt the facilities and added the fitness center, state-of-the-art electronic medical records, first-class operating facilities. They're rated among the best hospitals in the nation. Home values have even gone up in Ruville because of the improvements the hospital has made. And just like Ruville rose to the occasion when presented with challenges, we've met an artist who's doing exactly that himself. Take a minute to listen to his inspiring story. Tupelo native William Hurd's paintings are memorable. They're bright and colorful and leave a lasting impression. But nothing like the impression burned in William's mind one spring night in 2000. March the 14th, 2000 is the day I will always remember. I'll never forget. Um, I was going to school at Mississippi State. Uh, some friends and I were out a normal night, just hanging out. And uh, the ride home, uh, as we got close to the house, uh, he lost control of the car and the car fishtailed and went in a ditch. Um, I was sitting in the back seat and uh, I wasn't wearing my safety belt and I got thrown from the back seat into the windshield and um, I broke my C5-6 vertebrae. I hit the back of my neck right there and um, in an instant I knew I was paralyzed and they rushed me to the hospital in Starkville, they took x-rays and determined that it was broken. And then from that point, they put me in an ambulance and drove me straight to Tupelo. After finally stabilizing at Tupelo, William transferred to the Shepherd Center in Atlanta to begin his rigorous regime of physical and occupational therapy. But physical barriers were not the only obstacles William had to overcome. In the beginning, uh, oh, it was, I was, very depressed. Uh, my mindset was not in the right place. I pretty much, uh, in the beginning, wanted to uh, uh, wanted to die. I didn't want to live. It was really uh, dark, dark. Uh, I was mad at the world, mad at God. I was uh, not nice to my family and my friends. Most people with disabilities, if they have lost some function. Um, as the result of an injury or they've incurred some type of a disability and they lose some function in their body, they're going to go through those same seven stages of grief that you go through if you lose a loved one. So yeah, you go through the disbelief, the anger, the depression, the denial, and then finally the acceptance. After that year of being depressed and directing myself to oblivion one night, I woke up the next day thinking this is just uh, I can't live my life like this. This is not who I was before my accident. I've got to, I've got to move on. I've got to get on, on with it. And move on, William did. After finding solace and creative release in art, William searched for new ways to paint with limited finger dexterity. This movie came on called Pollock. It's about Jackson Pollock, a famous artist in the 50s who I knew nothing about. I don't, didn't really know much about any artist at this point. But this, this show came on and it showed how Jackson Pollock was sitting in his barn painting one day and paint dripped from his paintbrush onto the floor and then he started slinging paint on, onto the canvas. Drip painting was the answer. William found that by sticking brushes and spoons into styrofoam balls, he could control the paint. So I'd roll up down the hall and stick a spoon in the paint and lean over and drip paint onto the canvas. After uh, a time of doing that, I looked down and in all my cups and bowls, there's different color paints. I dripped into them. And so I said, well, let me just use a bowl. And I just grabbed a bowl of paint and just dumped on the canvas. And his technique continued to develop from there, and so did his love of painting. I like painting because I, I like what it makes me think. I, I, I think of, of happy thoughts. It's, 
it's fun, it's, it's, it's positive. As my painting grows, I grow with them. The joy and fulfillment William found in art inspired him to share that experience with others. And so, our artworks was born. Our artworks is a nonprofit organization we started around in 05. It was a grant we applied for from the Department of Rehabilitation Services. He came to me, he was doing his artwork, he was so good at it, and he wanted to start a class in Tupelo. His whole goal there with our artworks was to get just enough money, not a lot, but just enough money to purchase some supplies so that he could bring other people with disabilities into his studio and allow them to experience the same joy that he experiences every day when he's doing his artwork. And uh, it's just taken off and his students love it. I actually, I started out coming up here just to socialize because I wasn't a very, before my injury I was never very artistic and didn't think that I really had that ability until I was encouraged more and more by William to finally start painting. I finally gave it a shot and I actually was surprised that I had a creative side that I really didn't know about. When you first get injured, if you have an injury, you feel you feel safe at home, and people with disabilities are a little hesitant about getting out into the community, getting back out in the public, getting back out trying to live a normal life. What we have at the shop, our artworks, we can come there, it's in the center of Tupelo, and it's a gathering place where we meet, we can socialize, we do lots of different types of art, which is creating art is, uh, you have a sense of achievement, like you've accomplished something. I think that expressing ourselves when you have a disability is very important. It's one of the things that keeps you from getting hermit-like or depressed. And uh, William's helped a lot of people in the Tupelo area to avoid that by bringing them into his art classes and, and teaching them how to express themselves through art. One of William's favorite figures to paint is the butterfly. He sees it as indicative of the transformation he experienced after his accident. On the back of every butterfly that he paints, William writes a poem that he composed years ago. As I free in the sun, on the flowers I can run. My arms are on my legs as far as I can spread. Guide me through the wind is the call of my course, finding the answers, questioning remorse. The beauty of the beast grows inside a cocoon, finding its way out to the moon. This journey is a long and endless ride. With all my wings, I challenge the sky. Fannie Lou Hamer, Horace Stanzel, Duff Durham, Luster Bayless. Rubel has produced a lot of talent, including this man, uh, Jimmy Rogers. He was born here. Jimmy Rogers was a blues musician. And as a youth, he learned how to play harmonica, then guitar, and then began performing professionally. Jimmy was instrumental in helping craft the sound that became known as the Chicago blues, the more electric brother of the Delta's folk blues. And while blues music started in Mississippi and spread around the country, we caught up with another man who started in Mississippi and is making his way around the country. And instead of giving music to the masses, he's taking photographs and bringing them back here for us to see. My name is Josh Haley. I am a mixed media artist slash photographer slash lover of life from Jackson, Mississippi. I'm only happy when it rains. I was always into art. I always liked to do drawings as a child. Photography is my medium by which to express and the one that I guess I, I express and I guess I'm able to make a living with. So it's been, the, it's been my vehicle for the most part. It's a nice little stove. There you are. That old adage, the uh, a picture can tell a thousand words is is so true. A picture can stop a war. I mean, we, we, all, we know, we've, we've seen how powerful photography is. If you have a piercing image, be it from remembering your wedding day or your child or just the way something was, it's a, it's a moment in time, it's a frame of reference. To see something that moves you and to see something that's like, whoa, I didn't see that before, I didn't see you can, it can a, a picture can change the world, and it has. You can't see the rain. I have a little bit of wanderlust, so I like to travel. I can't stand the rain. 
In the last year, I guess I've, I'm kind of a artist slash photographer slash adventurist and uh, a big uh, pro-American trying to spread the love of what's going on in the country. Hey, this is Josh Haley from Photo America. I was traveling around in 2011. I was crossing the country, driving a lot, and talking and um, couch surfing with a lot of people. I'm on a community called couchsurfing.org, which I think is an amazing community. And uh, I was staying with amazing people who were telling me their stories and showing me their cities and what really, in an artistic way, what makes them happy and what, what they love in their life. So I decided that it was, a, it was no better time than to just pack everything in my car and kind of do my own little, like, just seeing what makes America tick. Armed with a camera and megaphone, Josh embarked on a journey that would take him and his 92 Chevy van across all 50 states. It's a very people-driven uh, project. People steer this course, so I kind of set up a connect the dots, what makes a state a state, obviously the capital of the state, and a couple of other like key cities, and there's cultural things, there's, you know, history here, so within like five or six dots. I usually will have like a, I'm pretty much connecting the dots between the states, but then someone will just tell me that something else is going here and this is a better way to go. So I just, you have to wing it and then kind of like start somewhere, like a little connect the dots, la -di -da, -di da and then and just wing it from there. And this was no sightseeing photo essay tour. When Josh was not busy capturing images for his project, the rest of his time was devoted to talking with a countless number of people in hopes of gathering insight into the lives of the people who call America home. I try to interview everyone, every age, race, and creed. Tell me your name. Natalie Cunningham. Seth Collins. Christina Roberson. Leah Kazanian. Ryan Lane um, from Fuqua, Verena, North Carolina. And Aaron, where are we right now? Bowling Green, well, Glasgow, Kentucky. I talk to homeless people. I pick up hitchhikers all the time. I just, I want, I'm interested in everyone. In my opinion, this is a symbol of the people of the United States. You know, we're the United States of America. We and everything that's going on. I want to know what makes people tick, so I, you know. Interviewing three people a day, plus traveling four to five hours a day. It's a big country, America is. Every moment that I get to spend with someone in the present and have the time that they give me the time to talk to me is, is the best thing in the world. See the states, you can see all the states photographically and see some of the videos that we've made. From the time I wake up in the morning to the time the sun sets, I am moving in my van, I am walking around meeting people, I am shooting. Every day is a non-stop day. With the people that I meet and the experiences that I'm having are that intense and that good. You just, it really just, it amps you to just keep going. You need to know about it, photoamerica.com. 50 states in one and a half years and 80 weeks. Not 50 states, 50 weeks. I shoot a Walmart in each state. I shoot pawn shops, gold shops, sign spinners. I shoot the beauty, the, the natural beauty, the national parks, the, the things that we're so blessed to have in this country. And then I also shoot all of the stuff that really is what we know America is, is all that stuff in between. This is the 10 flags of the Communist Manifesto. The good, the bad, the ugly. But I'm trying to see what people do think and what makes people do what they do in life. Tell stories. Because I do think that in itself is the most powerful thing that we have, is educating through storytelling. Well, I was born in Madagascar, grew up in Mississippi, moved around a little bit, and now I live in Kentucky. <laughs> We can have empathy, we can understand the inner force that's making us all human right now. One thing I, I do think is people just, people don't trust people anymore. We're, on the, we're in the confines of, you know, that's the way we think. That's the news that's given to us. It's the sensational murder, 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 death, death, wah. And that's just, that's just not the way it is. That's not what life is about. Life is very short. And life's no fun when you don't when you're scared of everything. I mean, you gotta you gotta open up and then know that the world is not a scary place. It's it's a beautiful place. 
it's where it's why people make art. It's why people see beauty. It's because it is a beautiful place. I will forever be changed, especially after this trip, just because I do. I, I open myself to all things every day now. And I don't, you know, it's, it has relaxed me in my, my heart, mind, and spirit. And it's put a whole different trust in humanity, which I think we're lacking today. I'm just a lover and I'm a dreamer and I'm, I'm just a passionate about living a good life and sharing that with others. Hello. Would you like to go on a journey through America with me? Regrettably, that's all the time we have for this week. If you've got a question about anything you've seen in the show, contact us at mpdonline.org slash Mississippi Roads or join our Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.